So hello, everyone. Good evening again. Um, I'm not going to wait longer, but I want to welcome you all again, for those of you who were here yesterday, to the second of the public lectures of the Institute for Critical Social Inquiry. This has become our tradition. Um, my name is Ann Stoller, as many of you know, the founding director of the Institute. And we were counting this afternoon, I realized we've had more than 300 fellows from around the world over the last years, even though we had to, you know, arrest everything during COVID for two years. So it's, it's really incredible to think that probably people from 40 countries um, have been here over all of those years and always more than half from the Global South. That's part of our, our, our criteria of making sure that, that it's very dispersed. So each year we invite three key thinkers, right, whose critical work in the valuation of groups of us have shaped so many people's research and ways of seeing and being in the world. So it's not just, you know, what their dissertations are going to be, but actually how they live in the world and imagine what doing is about rather than just... Um, thinking about what we do. And this year, we're particularly privileged to have three known for their work in the fields of surveillance, Eyal Weisman last night. Um, we heard yesterday critical race theory uh, today um, from Kendall. And um, tomorrow night, Mackenzie Wark on the trans exception. So it's very special to get to introduce those whose activisms and political interventions are probably as important as their scholarship. Um, that is not a denigration of their scholarship. That's saying just how great the ranges of what they do. Kendall Thomas, teacher, scholar, activist, artist, is one whose in critical investments are bold and clear. He's the Nash professor of law and co-founder of the Center for the Study of Law and Culture at Columbia, um, where he's been since 1984, which when you think of the history of where we were all at in 1984 on racial politics, right, and on sexual politics, that was a pretty incredible feat to live through that period and be there and transform it. I mean, that, that's what you did. Um, so one could start by noting that as a scholar of comparative constitutional law and human rights, his work has addressed the tensions of police power in the US and racial violence. His pedagogy is powerful and pointed when he supp supports young activists, reminding them, and I love this notion, that voting is a revolutionary act. That voting is a revolutionary. I never thought of voting as a revolutionary act but it's, it's a really interesting concept. Or one could note that he was the first law professor to assert his gayness publicly and only the second person of color to be hired at Columbia Law. Both of these features of his being and becoming stretch across all that he has done in a density of diverse venues that are hard to imagine. For Kendall Thomas, as one excellent essay written about him noted, Activism is a way of life, right? I love that he proudly considers himself that. And I'd agree, an outlier and an outlaw. I think those two observations were very cool. I think they, they really capture something. And we brought that up yesterday and the way in which this configuration uh, is quite different than some of the other configurations of, of stars that we've had. Um, when he started at Columbia, sexual intimacy with someone of the same sex was punishable as a felony, right? So he's not just making this up in a metaphoric way that he was an outlaw. He, he, he lived wanting to be one, right? Outlawing seems to come naturally to him. His AIDS activism began in the 1980s. He became a founding member of the Majority Action Caucus of ACT UP. 
He served as vice chair of gay men's health crisis. Exactly how he's had time to write so extensively in and about constitutional law and critical race theory is pretty hard to fathom. In 1995, he also was the you know, promulgator with, um, with Kimberly Crenshaw of the book, edited the book, and had essays in it on critical race theory from 1995, which is still the book, right? Sometimes when you say a classic, you know, you don't have to pay attention to it anymore, but this is still the book. Um, and its subtitle is really interesting to the key writings that formed the movement. His pursuits are synthetic and organically joined. From where he has performed at Joe's Pub since 2017 to his non-stage performances. I'm not sure whether this evening fits in, but I'm not really sure which, which this evening is actually. It's part of the non-performance or the performance. But we're thrilled to have him talk with us about what has become, we've had two different titles, um, it's, it, and he's doing all of it, so no problem. Race, racial democracy, and the politics of compulsory illiteracy, right? CRT and the war on woke. So, Kendall, please, thank you. I see you've got my history of the present here. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, I'm starting with that. Hello, everyone. It's uh, such a thrill to be here and to see all of you. Uh, I count it, uh, as they used to say in the Baptist church, uh, a privilege and an honor uh, to have been introduced by the dear uh, Ann Stoller, who is a scholar from whom I have learned since I first uh, heard her name uh, some decades ago and uh, was just over the moon that she asked me to be part of this august company of scholars who've gathered this week to do what has already for me been transformative uh, concept work. That's another phrase of Anne's. Uh, and I look forward to our remaining days. Uh, I was just telling uh, my teaching assistant, Kasim, that I'm not quite sure what shape I'll be in uh, by the end of the week because our days have been full. Uh, and uh, just this afternoon, this morning and, and afternoon, the, the insights of the participants in the seminar on the CRT culture wars uh, just opened up vistas and uh, visions of future work that I see them doing uh, and perhaps uh, us doing together. So this work of building a co-learning community uh, is important to me because one of the things that I firmly believe is that we have to imagine, envision, and make real another way of creating and sharing knowledge. Uh, the institution of the university I have uh, learned over the course of my many decades in it, first as a student and as a teacher, is both a source and a site of many of the injustices uh, that are our object of study. We are complicit uh, in ways uh, that our study, our modes of study, often blind us to. And so one of the things that's so wonderful about this week is the possibilities that it has offered for a certain pedagogical experimentalism uh, and uh, a way of, um, uh, of engaging one another, which given the institutional strictures 
uh, under which all of us so often work is not always possible. So all of this has been billed as a public lecture, I want to disavow at the outset uh, any uh, intention so as to defeat any expectation uh, that I'm going to um, offer anything except a few uh, inchoate and um, tentative uh, and revisable, perhaps even before I step off the podium or step away from the podium, thoughts on uh, the relationship between race, racial democracy, and what I'm calling the politics of compulsory illiteracy, um, specifically focusing on the critical race theory culture wars and the turn which we have witnessed uh, over the course of uh, the last few years, the turns, the many turns. I'm choosing, I'm choosing one uh, of the many um, moments uh, in this uh, 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 culture war. Uh, we read uh, this week as our very first reading, one of the readings that we read is an important essay by the late great Stuart Hall, uh, the title of which is Race is a Floating Signifier, right? And the lability and mobility and plasticity and, and, and elusiveness of race in this uh, age of multicultural racism is one in which um, uh, on a dime, right, the terms of the discourse about race can change from CRT and then uh, morph over to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then from there uh, to woke. Uh, and then from there start taking on multiple uh, accreted meanings uh, having to do with gender and gender identity, with sexuality, um, and with um, a whole host uh, of uh, questions and issues and conflicts that may not be named race, but where race may be present, both uh, either as a, 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 a coincident uh, concern or question uh, or as an enabling uh, conceptual, rhetorical, ideological construct. Uh, Juanima Lubiano of Duke University uh, has said famously, where is a place, where is race present uh, where something else is being talked about? And I think that uh, some of the important work that we've been doing uh, this week has been focused precisely on this question of where race is present in the present. Um, this um, day is uh, the anniversary of uh, the passage by the US Congress in 1866 of the 14th Amendment to the US Constitution, right? The words of which have not changed uh, since 1866, but uh, whose position and uh, deployment in the constitutional politics of the United States and in the power politics uh, of the United States has undergone uh, a whole uh, vertiginous uh, series of uh, transformations. And so uh, we focused on this question of discourse and it is the question of discourse uh, with which I want to tarry today. Uh, but I want to do so um, specifically uh, by reminding those of you who were present at the opening reception on Sunday that Ann Stoller 
urged and challenged us all to keep in mind uh, a question that I think is the question. Namely, what is this present? Right. Uh, her citation uh, in asking that question was, of course, to the 1784 essay by Immanuel Kant, uh, who wrote, if it is now asked, do we presently live in an, in an enlightened age? The answer is no, but we do live in an age of enlightenment. Uh, I think uh, one of the features of this present moment is that uh, the unified, unitary we uh, that Kant proposes uh, to uh, put this question to the subject of enlightenment, right, is a subject uh, who, if they exist, uh, are in crisis, right? I think, too, uh, that we, this we, this fractured we, uh, also inhabits a moment uh, in which time has blasted open, right? Uh, and we were just talking about this the other day. I am uh, very, very much aware as I get on a bus uh, in the morning at 116th Street and Fifth Avenue and ride that bus downtown, uh, not only that, I do not spend most of my day in the same space as many other New Yorkers, but that I do not inhabit the same historical time, right? Uh, these bodies which come into contact with one another uh, are in this present moment in so many ways, bodies that inhabit different life worlds and different temporalities in ways uh, that challenge the uh, very capacity right, uh, to think uh, this present moment. Uh, so if we were to put Kant's question to ourselves today uh, in what I think is still uh, manifestly, to use the word that Edward Said used in a famous essay, in which he talked about the age of Reagan, uh, in an age which is still manifestly the age of Trump, uh, I simply do not know uh, if we can answer either of these questions. Do we live presently in an enlightened age? Or the question, do we live in an age of enlightenment uh, with any confidence? Uh, nor do I know that uh, um, any answer we might offer uh, speaks only to the temporality and the spaces that some of us inhabit, which others do not. Right? And it is this loss uh, of the illusion, because on some level I think it always was an illusion, of a shared uh, world, uh, a shared horizon of uh, 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 of existence, I, I think the fragility of that uh, has made us all vulnerable uh, in a way that if we thought about it too much might well drive us mad. Um, uh, the specter of the pandemic hovers over us. Uh, I wasn't here in New York last week uh, and so I, don't, I can only imagine uh, what it must have been like last Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, to be confronted uh, yet again uh, with the reality that our confident enlightenment sense that we have mastered nature and that the position uh, 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 in which uh, we are situated with respect to uh, the planet is one of mastery, right, uh, uh, is shown to be um, uh, thoroughly false. Uh, we'll talk a little bit uh, about this question of enlightenment. In fact, on some level, uh, the question of enlightenment um, today <laughs> uh, is my subject. And uh, the question is a question uh, 
that uh, Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno asked in Dialectic of Enlightenment, which I want to talk about uh, just very briefly. Uh, in the mid midst of the, the horrific uh, uh, violence uh, and uh, murder and genocide and uh, self-inflicted uh, devastation of World War II. How is it uh, that at a moment in our history in which we are at the apogee of technological mastery, right, AI, uh, when I came to New York, I, for one, quite simply couldn't have imagined uh, this thing called uh, a cell phone, which was also a computer. Uh, the idea of a personal computer uh, eluded me. I thought I was doing something because I brought my electric typewriter with me uh, to New York, or I took my, my class notes um, daily on eight and a half by 14 yellow legal pads. Uh, we didn't have answering machines <laughs> in 1984. Um, and we have lived uh, through this period, uh, this postmodern condition, as David Harvey uh, 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 reminds us, which is characterized by uh, an acceleration and a condensation in um, our conditions of life in ways that you know are are deeply uh, unsettling, uh, and which it seems to me um, uh, make relevant Horkheimer and Adorno's question: How is it that uh, in this age of enlightenment we are nonetheless? Uh, still wrestling with the pervasive reality of barbarism, right? Of a barbarism um, that we saw in the summer of 2020, uh, a barbarism that a mere uh, three years ago had us all here in New York just coming out of uh, a double isolation. Well, we were in a double isolation. One, because of the pandemic, and two, because of a curfew that the mayor of New York City had declared. Uh, in the wake of the protests uh, that erupted when Americans, uh, indeed, when people all over the country uh, saw a Minneapolis police officer put his knee on the neck of a citizen of that city until he died. Uh, we encountered in our streets, our otherwise empty streets, uh, cadres of policemen who were effectively militarized, uh, civilian police militarized against their uh, co-citizens and co-denizens. Uh, we saw crowds of people who risked their lives uh, to come out into the streets uh, to raise their voices in concert uh, to protest the horror uh, that we had all witnessed uh, in uh, Minneapolis. And those protests uh, were, for me, uh, the inauguration of what in many ways I think is an unprecedented moment. I'm not sure uh, the people who study these things uh, tell us that we saw uh, protests, numbers of protests and people uh, at those protests uh, that were historic, right? Uh, uh, and this curfew, uh, the first time in 75 years that the city of New York had imposed a curfew, uh, interestingly enough, uh, had as one of its central provisions a prohibition, right? on the movement during curfew hours of anybody who, like me, lived above 96th Street, right? So the right to the city, the very right to the city um, was uh, 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 taken from citizens uh, through a kind of invisible um, uh, line of not just separation, but segregation. Uh, which was not racial <laughs> in any way, uh, but whose um, racial character and effects uh, were very much uh, present, right? Uh, 
to the New Yorkers whose voices I heard outside my window because being a person of a certain age, I stayed at home. Um, um, uh, and uh, I would hear these voices, you know, no justice, no peace, uh, which were part uh, with the sirens uh, from uh, the ambulances uh, careening down Fifth uh, Avenue uh, and the people banging pots and pans and applauding at 7 uh, p.m. every night um, and the dead silence uh, that pierced uh, my dreams uh, in June of 2020. Uh, but what was also clear is that we were witnessing the promise of a culture, a political culture of co-learning, of pedagogy, of public pedagogy uh, that had not been seen in this country in quite this way uh, since uh, the high water mark of the civil rights movement. Uh, and then on a dime, right, uh, the promise of that utopian pedagogy, right, uh, at whose um, center was a norm of state accountability to uh, the public, to the civic public, uh, that pedagogical register was transposed into a harsh, uh, ugly, and exclusionary key, right? Uh, with the public gatherings at which people taught one another uh, how to hate democracy um, and how to hate the culture of civic learning on which democracies depend, right? By burning, publicly burning books, something that I don't recall seeing in this country uh, in my lifetime, and crowding uh, the meeting rooms of school boards to call for a ban on any teaching and learning about race and the meaning of what had just happened right, uh, a few weeks before in Minneapolis. Uh, so uh, this moment right, uh, in which the critical culture of conversation about race is being erased right, and in which school book bans are being enacted in numbers that we've never seen before is a moment which marks the rise for me of what I'm sure historians may well remember as the age of compulsory illiteracy. Uh, and for me, a turning point uh, in that new age uh, through which we may well be living was in 2016, well before uh, George Floyd, well before uh, the pandemic in which Donald Trump speaking to a group of his supporters in a victory speech after the Nevada Republican primary said, I love the poorly educated. Uh, and in a way, uh, the Trump rallies during the campaign and since have to be seen in my view as a species of political pedagogy, right? Uh, which um, um, uh, have written in blood, right? Rewritten in blood, uh, or written in blood a culture of illiberalism, right? And anti-democracy, right? That harkens back to the period of Jim and Jane Crow uh, the very period, the very history about which uh, Trump and uh, those with whom 
he is allied. Uh, Governor DeSantis comes to mind, Governor Abbott comes to mind, um, and myriad state legislatures across the country who have imposed uh, a regime of compulsory illiteracy, specifically of compulsory racial literacy uh, that has deprived students uh, and people who use libraries uh, all over this country of access to the means of political uh, literacy, even basic literacy. Uh, and uh, we are in a position to see in a different light the uses, for example, of social media as a teaching tool and to see this, the culture war presidency of Donald Trump as a political pedagogical project, right? Uh, the word that the scholars would use is propaganda, right? Uh, but propaganda is a form of education, uh, or uh, as Carter Woodson uh, would put it, of miseducation, right? Uh, which is, uh, uh, whose efficacy cannot be denied. Uh, the executive order that Trump uh, issued in the fall of 2020 at the federal level became the model for administrative orders and legislation at the state and local level, uh, which has had effects not only on the terms of uh, public learning and public discourse about issues of race and racism, as I said earlier, uh, but about sexuality and sex, about reproductive rights, uh, about gender and gender identity, right? about ethnicity, right? uh, about the history of, um, uh, of this country as such. Right? Uh, and the um, rhetorical uh, deployment of uh, what amounts to a language of death, right, in many ways, uh, which seems symbolic and was dismissed, uh, 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 um, concerns about which were dismissed as overblown. Uh, we are seeing uh, that the violence uh, that uh, was behind this political pedagogical project uh, was not merely symbolic. Uh, but very real. So when we see these words like purge and eliminate, uh, they take on uh, a new and different meaning. And we're reminded, um, as Toni Morrison reminded us again in 1995, that like its succubus twin racism, fascism is recognizable by its need to purge. But this was a productive purge, right? Um, I'm, I'm, I can drop a footnote here to Foucault, right? Uh, power, uh, he reminded us many years ago, is not just about prohibition and interdiction. Power is productive, right? So you have this pas de deux, uh, which is about purging and producing, right? Uh, knowledge uh, or deformed knowledge um, in which uh, under the guise of enlightening the public, right, as to our true history to the true meaning of America, uh, you uh, have excluded other knowledges and other histories. Uh, so um, I mentioned the executive order which focused on uh, divisive concepts, uh, but in July of 2020, uh, President Trump, Trump staged a mass Independence Day rally in Keystone, South Dakota against the backdrop of the Mount Rushmore carvings of four American presidents. You saw the image earlier. Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and Roosevelt. And he began his oration with a tribute to the exceptional lives and extraordinary legacies of his predecessors that quickly segued into an attack on the millions of Americans of every age, race, ethnicity, sex, gender, sexuality, and religion who had taken to the streets uh, of America over the summer in peaceful protests against the police killings of uh, their fellow citizens. He painted a word picture of angry mobs, uh, not co-citizens, but angry mobs who are trying to tear down, I'm quoting him here, 
the statues of our founders deface our most sacred memorials and unleash a wave of violent crime in our cities. He fulminated against a new far left fascism that uh, would censor, banish, blacklist, persecute, and punish anyone who refused to speak its language, perform its rituals, recite its mantras, and follow its commandments. Uh, and, 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 and therefore, through this projective <laughs> attack, was um, pre previewing and prefiguring uh, what his own program uh, would be. Uh, Trump raised the specter of a, quote, left-wing cultural revolution whose aim was to overthrow the American Revolution. Uh, he told his listeners that almost against every law of society and nature, American school children were being taught in school to hate their country. Uh, and in a preview of the presidential seminar that would continue into the fall, he declared that the radical view of American history is a web of lies. All perspective is removed. Every virtue is obscured. Every motive is twisted. Every fact distorted and every flaw is magnified until the history is purged and the record is disfigured beyond recognition. Uh, uh, our people, he said, have a great memory. Right? Uh, nowhere in his speech did he note, though, um, the fact that two of the American presidents whose images were carved into the Black Hills granite behind him had owned property in other human beings. So the register of his speech was very different than the executive order that he'd issued a few months before, uh, which uh, I won't discuss, but a few days after the Mount Rushmore speech, Mr. Trump recorded an interview with the television journalist Chris Wallace on Rupert Murdoch's Fox News channel. I just look, I look at school, I watch, I read, look at the stuff. Now they want to change if 1492 Columbus discovered America. You know we grew up, you grew up, that's what we learned. Now they want to make it the 1619 Project. Where did that come from? What does it represent? I don't even know, Chris Wallace replies, slavery. <laughs> Donald Trump, that's what they're saying. But they don't even know. They just want to make a change. We can't let them change the true meaning of what we're all about. Uh, and then we get the attack uh, on woke. Uh, one of our most perceptive uh, cultural commentators had this to say. Then, when about. we look at some of your work here, yes, uh, what does this mean to you, visually? This album cover, we're looking at New America Part One, Fourth World War. Inside yeah, I mean, of the Afro are so many different things. You know, they're signs of the time. They're in my mind. Yeah. Because New America Part One was me standing on an apex or standing at the top of something, observing everything. There are no solutions in this album. It's just <laughs> what I've what I've observed. Thomas Dewey said, "Okay, a problem well stated is a problem half solved." I understand that. <laughs> Could be, <laughs> but we did start a lot of stuff on there. Yeah. Um, there's a song on this particular album called Master Teacher. And in that song, Master Teacher, the chorus is, I stay woke. Mm. So stay woke was introduced to the world by way of this album, New America Part One. And uh, I tweeted it about this uh, group that was uh, detained, Pussy Riot. They're this uh, group of activists who are artists. And in my tweet, I said, free Pussy Riot and hashtag stay woke. After that, Woke took off. Your art yeah. took this concept. Ideas and words can evolve, but it really put this out, this idea we should wake up to these problems and stay woke. Sure. We track how you started it and how it spread, and then how some on the, on the right are sort of hijacking or attacking it or giving it a different definition. Sure. So I want to play this for you since you bring it up, and then you, we could talk about it. All right. Even though you go through struggle and start to keep a healthy life, I Stay woke. Stay woke. Yeah. 
Um, it's just urging folks to pay attention, to be alert. Wow. <laughs> I want my coaches to stay woke, but I want the other coaches that's supporting us to stay woke. Woke fascism that will <laughs> destroy our nation. We will never, ever surrender to the woke mob. Florida is where woke goes to die. I think they mean black. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in case you were under any doubt, you know, listen to this general, metaphor. His name was General Kane. I don't even know. Maybe he's not even on my side. Who the hell knows with these generals? You know, I'm, <laughs> when I get through with this guy, Millie, I mean, how about Millie? Remember? Remember? Remember when I walked to the church, proudly walked to the church, that the protesters, they tried to burn it down, but I walked to the church, protesters out there, and Millie was walking with me. And the next day, the radical left media starts calling, you shouldn't have walked, you shouldn't have walked. Instead of saying, I'm proud to walk with my president, not because it's me, because of the office. Instead of saying that, he wanted to apologize for walking with the president of the United States. And I said, and I said, this guy doesn't have what it takes. And uh, you're seeing that now because the worst decisions I've ever seen. That's, again, why I put the patent. I just remembered it as I was coming over here. I said, get that clip quickly. The people of Alabama understand that clip. Do you think that? Let me ask you, do you think that General Patton was woke? I don't think so. What do you think, Mike? Mike, was he woke? I don't think so. I don't think he was too woke. He was the exact opposite. You know what woke means? It means you're a loser. Everything woke. Everything woke. It's true. Everything woke turns to shit, OK? It's true. It's true. Look at what's happening. Woke means black. Woke means shit, right? Uh, now, the pedagogy of a Donald Trump uh, almost approaches farce. Uh, if it weren't uh, so dangerous, we would be tempted to laugh, uh, but the anti-woke crusade has been taken up uh, in the sacred precincts of the university uh, by scholars such as my, 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 my colleague, uh, John McWhorter, who has this to say uh, about critical race theory, which he yokes uh, to woke. So think about in the wake, to use Christina Sharp's phrase, in the wake of woke, which originates in the culture migrates into politics and ends up uh, as an object of study in university. This is uh, John McWhorter on, on critical race theory. Critical race theory tells you uh, that everything is about hierarchy, power, their abuses. And if you are not Caucasian in America, then you are akin to the captive oarsmen, slaves training below decks in chains. Almost anyone can see what a reductive view this is of modern society, even without having read their Rousseau or Rawls. We must not be taken in by the fact that this is called critical, that it's about race, and that it's titled a theory. It is a fragile, performative ideology, one that rejects linear reason, traditional legal theorizing, and even enlightenment rationalism. Um, here, as elsewhere in the book, McWhorter wraps his critique of woke, uh, which is in part uh, a justification for his not even engaging right, with the project of trying to persuade people, the people who, the certain people who embrace this ideology, that they may be wrong. Uh, he says, reason must prevail. This is the heart of the Enlightenment. He wraps himself in uh, the mantle of the Enlightenment, uh, seemingly oblivious uh, to the dark dialectic uh, of Enlightenment, uh, a dialectic, for example, uh, that Horkheimer and Adorno talk about um, in, for example, uh, their observation uh, about the liberal thesis, which is a term that stands not 
uh, just for liberalism as a philosophy, but for liberalism uh, as uh, an executed program. For example, uh, through uh, liberal legalism, uh, which is the target uh, of one of the central targets of uh, critique of critical race theory. They write, the liberal thesis is true as an idea. That's its utopian enlightenment impulse. It contains an image of the society in which rage would no longer produce itself or seek qualities on which to be discharged. But by assuming the unity of humanity to have been already realized in principle, the liberal thesis serves as an apology for the existing order. So enlightenment ends up entrenching the relations of domination that it was uh, fashioned and forged to address. Uh, in another place, uh, this also formula a version of this formulation also appears in Minima Moralia, which uh, Adorno author authored alone. Now equivalence, right? Because the law is all about equivalence, the Aristotelian principle. Likes must be treated alike, right? Um, now equivalence itself, legal formalism becomes a fetish the blindfold over the eyes of justitia means not only that justice brooks no interference, but that it doesn't even originate in freedom. Right? Uh, and so is this gap between the claims of freedom and the unfreedom in fact um, of enlightenment uh, that uh, 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 um, provoked uh, the Frankfurt School and uh, Horkheimer and Adorno in the Dialectic of Enlightenment to consider uh, this constitutive relationship between civilization uh, and barbarism um, in the terms uh, of Benjamin's um, thesis on the philosophy of history. Uh, uh, another scholar uh, focuses on the ways in which Enlightenment is a racial project. Cornel West in Prophesied Deliverance uh, writes that the initial structure from its inception of modern discourse in the West secretes the idea of white supremacy. Uh, the forms of rationality, scientificity, and objectivity, as well as aesthetic and cultural ideas of modern Enlightenment discourse require the constitution of the idea of white supremacy. One such idea that cannot be brought within the field of initial modern discourse, he, he says, is that of black equality. Uh, Gunnar Myrdal, uh, writing the same year as Horkheimer and Adorno in An American Dilemma, uh, uh, observes the coincidence of enlightenment and race as a very concept. Uh, he says, the dogma of racial equality uh, may in a sense be regarded as a strange fruit of the enlightenment. The fateful word race itself uh, is I think I meant to write inequality. The fateful word race itself is actually not yet 200 years old. The biological ideology had to be utilized as an intellectual explanation of and a moral apology for slavery in a society which went out emphatically to invoke as its highest principles the ideals of inalienable rights of all men to freedom uh, and equality of opportunity. Uh, but I want to submit to you that we don't even need Horkheimer Adorno or Cornell West. Um, to understand the ways in which uh, um, we have uh, uh, a choice, uh, an intellectual choice and an ethical choice, uh, a political choice uh, before us at this moment, in this present, right, with respect to the attack on woke. We can either dissociate ourselves from it uh, or dismiss it as, as some have done uh, as even some critical uh, race theorists have done, or uh, we can undertake the patient, difficult, uh, 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 and, and not always uh, rewarding work of critical social inquiry to try to understand this phenomenon on the ground. Uh, and this generation of mostly young people uh, who are uh, situating themselves, whether they know it or not, in a relationship to the project of vernacular enlightenment uh, that was begun by the Black Reconstruction Generation. Uh, Frederick Douglass famously wrote uh, in the 19th century that education and slavery are incompatible with each other. And one could fairly view uh, the entire trajectory of African people in America uh, around the axis of education uh, and the investment in education, both 
uh, as um, uh, a practice of enlightenment uh, and as a practice of freedom, right? Uh, the links between enlightenment and emancipation uh, and the critique of enlightenment and emancipation are clear. Uh, a brief history, um, I'm mindful of the time, of the law and politics of compulsory racial illiteracy in this country. Uh, the United States stands alone um, in, uh, among all the countries that had slavery, in uh, enacting uh, and enforcing as a, a criminal law prohibitions on teaching enslaved Americans how to read and write. Uh, learning while black, in other words, uh, was a crime. The Virginia Revised Code of 1819 uh, made it a crime punishable uh, by physical uh, 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 lashing uh, to gather for slaves or free Negroes or mulattoes to gather uh, at any school or schools for purposes of learning to read and write. No surprise then that one of the first things uh, newly freed African Americans wanted to do was to learn how to read. Uh, a Freedmen's Bureau officer observed that a Negro riding on a loaded wagon, sitting on a hack waiting for a train, or by the cabin door is often seen book in hand delving after the rudiments of knowledge. A group on the platform of a depot, after carefully conning an old spelling book, resolves itself into uh, a class. Uh, W.B. Du Bois, in his magisterial study, Black Reconstruction in America, hones in on uh, the fact that uh, black folks wanted two things, land, right? We know 40 acres and a mule. Uh, but in addition to that, he says, they wanted to know. They wanted to be able to interpret the Kabbalistic letters and figures which were the key to more. They were consumed with curiosity at the meaning of the world. They were consumed with desire for schools. Indeed, uh, Du Bois goes on to say that the black reconstruction generation and its practice of abolition education was responsible for the establishment in the South of what we now know as the public school, right? without which uh, uh, generations of white Southerners would not have received uh, an education. So um, to understand uh, public education, uh, uh, racial literacy, uh, as a practice of freedom, as an instance of what I've been calling vernacular enlightenment from its inception, is to understand something of what is at stake uh, today in classrooms all across the country. Uh, the civil rights movement itself uh, uh, was inaugurated around the question of education. Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954, um, a school, uh, a, a case involving school children in five uh, cities in the United States had at its heart, um, the stakes in that case were about education and democratic citizenship. Uh, the court notes uh, that uh, education is required in the performance of our most basic public responsibilities, that it is the foundation of good citizenship. So the court makes an argument from democracy in striking down Jim Crow uh, public school education. Uh, and the protests uh, that brave African Americans waged leading up to Brown, uh, and indeed in the teeth of the resistance to desegregation, which was never integration, it's never been integration, uh, and I say that mindful that we are living in a city uh, which is the most racially, has the most racially segregated public school system in the United States. Uh, black, uh, Parents and their children understood that what was at stake uh, in access to learn was a right to literacy and that the right to literacy uh, involved democratic citizenship. Uh, a more recent case, Gary B. versus Snyder, was the first case which formulated, to my knowledge, uh, that what was at stake in demanding the right to an equal education uh, was a right to literacy. The complaint in that case offered a litany of horrors uh, regarding the conditions under which black school children in the city of Detroit were expected to learn. And in the suit they brought uh, against the governor of Michigan, the Department of Education of Michigan, uh, the plaintiffs in Gary B. versus Snyder argued that the conditions of public schools in the city of Detroit deprived them of a right to basic literacy 
And that illiteracy was slavery by another name. Right? Uh, but they understood the connection between the struggle for racial literacy and democratic literacy, between racial justice and democratic justice. They understood uh, that in fighting to protect the right to literacy for themselves and their children, they were fighting to secure that right for other Americans, mostly uh, poor, working class, white Americans, uh, who were also being ill-served uh, by public schools. In 2020, when the Georgia State Department of Education enacted a resolution condemning uh, critical race theory, they used that resolution as a cover and camouflage for uh, cutting almost one uh, billion dollars from the budget of uh, the Georgia uh, public school system. And we live in an America now where 32 uh, million adults can't read uh, and where 50% of US adults cannot uh, read a book written at grade level. This history is part of the broader history of the criminalization of black literacy. Um, and uh, in a, a, a series of observations that I will not have time to make, um, I want to suggest that um, a critical, a race critical uh, analysis of the question of political and racial literacy, of the regime of compulsory literacy, cannot not pay attention to the connections between uh, miseducation and mass incarceration. Um, so the effort to ban CRT uh, at the end of the day also challenges us, I think, to move from the dominant frame uh, in our law and politics, which is organized around the idea of discrimination and anti-discrimination, uh, to a larger and, to my mind, richer uh, 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 understanding that uh, enlarges our vision of the rights in question beyond the constitutional rights frame into a human rights frame uh, and understands uh, the questions, the battles around uh, literacy uh, and uh, uh, learning uh, as implicating a right to development, to political, social, and economic development. Uh, I leave you with um, the language of one of the platforms of the movement uh, for black lives, which argued uh, actually within the human rights frame for the recognition of a constitutional right at both the state and federal levels to a fully funded education, which includes a clear articulation of the right to a free education for all, special protections for queer and trans students, wraparound services, social workers, health services, and a curriculum that acknowledges and addresses students' material and cultural needs, physical activity and recreation, high quality food, free daycare and freedom from search, seizure, and arrest. In other words, for an end to the carceralization of education. Kant writes, enlightenment is man's emergence from self-imposed immaturity. Immaturity is an inability to use one's understanding without guidance from another. This immaturity is self-imposed when its cause lies not in lack of self-understanding, but in lack of resolve and courage to use it without guidance from another. Saper aude. Dare to know. Have courage to use your own understanding. That is the motto of enlightenment. Uh, another formulation of the critical spirit uh, uh, to which Kant gives voice uh, in this passage from Was ist auf Klarung is uh, that of James Baldwin, uh, who writes, I love America more than any country in the world, and exactly for this reason, I insist on my right to criticize her perpetually. Or as the poet Langston Hughes put it, I too sing America. As a child on the picket lines of Oroville, California marching, uh, one of the uh, 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 lines that stays in my head uh, was um, a reinterpretation and reinvention and retooling of a song that we grew up uh, with in church, uh, which suggests that uh, the project, the Vernacular Enlightenment project of woke, uh, which is not without its flaws. I don't want to celebrate um, uh, or romanticize uh, 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 the, the ways in which woke has been weaponized within 
uh, black uh, racial and other racial justice movements in ways that actually impede uh, the very goals uh, of, of the movement. Uh, that's what happens when you have a wounded attachment um, to a certain vision of identity politics. But I do want to end with these words uh, in song uh, that I learned on the picket line. And we sang uh, this song in the 60s and 50s. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind Stayed on freedom, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Uh, that song was taught to me uh, by my grandmother, uh, who graduated from high school, uh, who had she had an opportunity uh, to go to college. Uh, might have lived a life which allowed her to stand on a podium like this by my great-grandmother, Eva, uh, who, with her sister and neighbors, created a culture of public learning on their porches, reading the Chicago Defender and arguing uh, about the ideas uh, that were in the articles. Uh, this culture of wokeness um, is worthy of defense, and I take my stand uh, alongside uh, the generations of African Americans uh, who insist on our right to stay woke. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, so wonderful in so many ways. Um, Instead of leaving this around, could anyone who wants to make a comment, ask a question, sing? Um, <laughs> I apologize for speaking so long. I had no idea no, it's okay. uh, until it's about okay. 5.40 <laughs> that I had 30 minutes of lecture to go. Thank you so much for your contribution to the week and everything else that you've done up to this point in, in the field. Um, I was so struck by the one quote that you had, um, and it just how it exhibited the insidiousness of this kind of construction of racism in these ways that can go underneath um, detection, because if it's trickery, where it talked about how civilized Caucasians agreed that, um, you know, education uh, for, for black people in America was, was wrong. Mm. And so it was just so insidious the way that these words were crafted mm. and, um, and just, just shows the ways that we need to stay woke in, in so many aspects that are so careful and not just loud ways. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Nicole. Um, so I, I wanted to ask, or maybe, I don't know, it's one of these statement questions that happen at these things all the time. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about uh, education mm -hmm. and the way that it can sort of happen in these um, more public spaces, right, in protest and things of that nature. Um, I'm not sure if you've read uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates' The Beautiful Struggle, mm -hmm. um, but there's a theme throughout that book about um, the role of knowledge mm -hmm. in um, hip hop music mm -hmm. and, and like that knowledge as kind of like a, like a badge of honor. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I'm wondering if you can sort of speak about um, that kind of like street literacy mm -hmm. that might help black Americans stay woke in a way that um, can never happen uh, when we're having these kind of CRT wars, mm -hmm. right? 
mm -hmm. um, when the battle is about what can be taught mm -hmm. in schools, mm -hmm. um, when schools are regulated, mm -hmm. um, you know, is, is that hip hop knowledge a kind of the porch learning that you were talking about? Mm -hmm. um, so, it, mm -hmm. comment, question sort mm -hmm. of thing? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, um, I think there are many uh, un, um, underutilized sites uh, and opportunities for precisely the kind of vernacular uh, pedagogy that uh, hip hop uh, represents. Uh, but I also think uh, that can take place in the university. And since all of us are, uh, most of us at least are, uh, affiliated with uh, work and study in universities. Uh, I'll just share with you the uh, extraordinary experience that I've had, uh, which is one of the reasons why I featured the part of the, the, the lecture where I had to uh, rush through the slides about relationship between uh, the regime of compulsory illiteracy and mass incarceration. Uh, for three years, I have co-taught a course uh, with um, um, a colleague at Columbia, a recently retired colleague at Columbia, who served time in prison. And uh, the course is critical race theory. When I started teaching critical race theory, it never occurred to me that someday I would find myself in a classroom co-teaching with someone who'd served time in prison. Although, you know, I grew up with, uh, love, uh, any number of people who served time in prison and, be, and could well have ended up in a prison myself, right? Um, um, and this past year, uh, through, uh, the uh, good graces of the Justice and Education Program at Columbia, initiative in Com at Columbia, we were able to uh, hire and pay seven uh, individuals, formerly incarcerated individuals, to be part of the Critical Race Theory Seminar as podcast consultants for the second season of uh, a podcast, a student team produced podcast that is part of the Critical Race Theory Seminar Workshop called CRT2. Check it out where you get your podcast, CRT2. Um, and uh, these folks transform the learning experience uh, for our students, for all of us really, in much the same way that my teaching experience had been transformed by working uh, with Floris Forbes, uh, my co-teacher in that course. Uh, and they didn't just help with the podcast, they helped um, with the weekly learning because they sat in on the seminars. They did the reading, they wrote, uh, we shared writing, uh, and, and, and uh, Fred Moden uh, and Stefano Haney talk about um, the relationship that black people have of theft to the university. And here we are in Morningside Heights, AKA Harlem, um, uh, sharing a resource uh, with people, some of whom for most of their lives thought that the space of Columbia University was a no-enter zone, right? And so I think there are a multiplicity of possibilities that we have yet to explore. I mean, um, many of you uh, know about, and I know some of you work uh, with prison education initiatives, uh, but I think the, the relationship uh, has to flow in both directions. And uh, we're in a really interesting moment where we're seeing universities all over the country open up to the idea of making uh, formal education uh, available uh, to people who uh, historically uh, have been excluded from access to the means of literacy that a university uh, represents. So um, I uh, think that you know, one of the things that's going to need to happen is that we're going to rethink our idea of what, not what the university is, but where the university is. Um, uh, instead of teaching outside university classrooms only during strikes, what would it mean to hold our classes, you know, um, in public housing projects uh, and to invite people uh, who will never have the money to attend the new school to participate in those learning possibilities. So I, I, um, I thank you for raising the question. And I thank you for raising all of the questions you've raised for us so much. So Kendall, thank you again and good night everyone. Thank you. Thank you all.